<laughs> That's the most important part. He does have coffee. The MVP right there. He is the MVP. He does more than make coffee. He saves me every single day. So. <laughs> Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. It's such a pleasure to have all of these new faces and this is not going to be that scary, I promise you. <laughs> Without further ado, I would like to introduce Jill Gifford with the UNL Food Entrepreneur Program as mm -hmm. our spotlight speaker today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is great. I love this whole setting. I'm not behind a podium doing all this, so this is lovely. Um, my name is Jill Gifford, and I'm with the UNL Food Processing Center, and I manage our National Food Entrepreneur Program. And I have a quick slideshow I'm going to go through and then just open it up, because usually there's lots of questions that people have. So this is a picture of our building, and we're actually on the um, Nebraska Innovation Campus, the old fairgrounds. And so this is our building. We're the furthest one to the south. And before I forget, if anyone ever wants tours of our building, it doesn't have to be a big group. We take one person. Just let me know. We're always happy to show it off. So if anybody ever wants to visit, just give me a call and we'll arrange it. Well worth it. Um, That's right. Whoop. Oh. I'm not getting anything. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think the battery might have died. It. Okay, I'll, I'll holler at you. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so first just a little background on the Food Center. This started in 1982. These three groups, people from the um, university and then people from the Nebraska Department of Economic Development and the private food industry got together and started talking about what could we do to help the food industry in Nebraska. So they came up with the idea of a food center and it actually was started in 1983. We were the first food center in the nation. There are obviously many more now, but we can kind of hang our hat on that, that we were the first ones to come up with that idea and get it started. Yeah, I think you're gonna have to. The light went out on this, thank you. Okay, so basically what our mission statement is, is to provide assistance to food manufacturers. Um, anywhere from large existing companies like ConAgra size companies down to very small startup individual companies. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, we do have a professional staff of about 20 people. They're all food scientists except for me. I'm the only business person. All the other food scientists, they have various areas of expertise and, and places that they work in in the food center. For obvious reasons, all the work we do with clients is on a confidential basis. And then we do provide assistance all around the country and even in many foreign countries. We do have clients that we work with. Go ahead. Okay, we basically divide the food center into eight areas of, of services. So we have pilot plants. We have about 20,000 square feet just for our pilot plants. So we can do scale up work for companies. Um, you know, it's still pilot plant equipment, but we can scale up recipes, see how it's going to work on manufacturing equipment. Um, large companies might come in and, and, and have us do work in our pilot plants because it means that they don't have to shut down a line in their facility to try something new. Pilot plant equipment still takes much less product to get it running. Like, you know, we have an extruder that we could probably start with 200 pounds of ingredients. If you went to a big manufacturer, it'd probably be 2,000 pounds before they could turn it on. And so big companies also like to utilize that. We have all kinds of different lab services that we provide. We have a certified micro lab, so we can do all kinds of testing product and process development to either help companies that are developing new products or startup companies that maybe come in with a handwritten recipe that they want us to start working with and getting it so it can be produced. Sensory analysis where we can bring in panelists to taste test products, things like that. Labeling is a huge issue because there are so many government regulations and it can be overwhelming, but we can work and go through and help people just establish certain parts of a label or we can look at the whole package and figure out what's needed on here. The ARE group, Applied Research and Engineering, this is a group that does do research, um, but it's research specific. So like maybe the Honey Board or a company would come and say, we need you to research this for us. And then we can do that research, present them with a report. And depending on 
who's having us do it and what they want to do with the report. Like, you know, the boards and associations often will say, let's go ahead and publish this for everyone. So it just depends what they want to do. Um, we do all kinds of workshops for the industry. They're usually fairly focused, like we do an extrusion workshop, which would be for engineers that are doing extrusion work. We do a micro workshop where we bring in quality assurance people, quality control people, and that sort of thing. And then the last area that I'm going to focus on is our small business development services. So this is for the people that are thinking about starting a food company. All right, so it's our National Food Entrepreneur Program, and it's actually um, a two-phase program, which I'll go into in more detail, but it starts with a one-day recipe to reality seminar, and then following that seminar, if people choose to, they can go into product to profit. Go ahead. Okay, so what kinds of people come? First of all, we get people from all over the country, and this is something we can be really proud of because there is not, there are a few programs that are very similar around the country to what we do, but because of the way they're funded, they can't necessarily work with anyone outside of their state or their region. And we can work with anybody anywhere in the country. So we get, I would say, probably 50% of the people that use our program are from out of state, not necessarily from Nebraska. So we get a lot of people that maybe have a family recipe that everybody's telling me ought to start selling this. We get farmers and ranchers that want to learn how to add value to whatever they're growing, whatever they're producing, raising. We get a lot of people selling at farmers markets that maybe now they're getting stores that would like to carry their product and they need to know what the next steps are. Um, chefs, restaurant owners, maybe they have a house specialty in the restaurant, like a pasta sauce, and they want to start marketing it and selling it into grocery stores and things like that. And then we're also in the last probably five to 10 years, we're seeing a lot of health professionals that have come up with some kind of a food product they think addresses one of the many health needs that we have in this country. And they want to learn how to go ahead and, and turn that into something they can sell. Okay. So we start him with a one day seminar. Basically, this is a decision making tool. The purpose of this day is to help them understand these are all the things you're gonna do if you start a company. These are the decisions you should make before you start. So that at the end of the day, they can make a good choice for themselves because it's not for everybody. And so if we can help them figure out in one day what they need to consider, we feel like that's really good. Even if the decision is, I don't want to do this, that's okay. We still consider that a win. So we spend the whole day talking about a lot of different areas. And one of the things we focus on in the morning is a feasibility study. That they need to think about doing a feasibility study to see if it's even an idea that's worth developing into a business. And so we divide that into three areas. We talk about market research. They need to figure out who the market is, who the competition is, who the consumer is, you know, all that kind of information. We go through and give them all that information. We give them very practical tools to start doing that research on their own. If that all comes out positive for them, then they can move on to product development. And so in the seminar, we talk about, we don't teach them how to be product developers, but we talk about the process and how that recipe has to be changed. It has to get on a weight basis and you have to source industrial ingredients and you have to use processing procedures that would be used in manufacturing because most of them are using kitchen household procedures and we have to make sure we get that converted. So then if you get through the product development, you end up with the product and the, consumer, the customer is happy with it and they're ready to go on. Then the third section of feasibility is where you're gonna produce it. Are you gonna use a shared use kitchen and do it yourself? Do you wanna set up your own facility? Do you want to use a co-packer? And so we talk about all those options and the pros and cons of each so that then they can, they can work on that. So if all three of these steps of their feasibility are met, then they're ready to go ahead and start actually launching and setting the business up. So that we spend probably about an hour and a half, two hours on in the morning, just going through all this information with them. So, so then some other areas we cover in the seminar, we talk about food safety. Um, 
And this is almost kind of to scare people because we really want people to understand that this is really important. And again, we're not going to teach them to be food safety experts, but we just really want them to understand the different hazard areas and what those entail and, and where those issues might come from when we try to give real practical things for them to understand so they start to realize this food safety is a big deal. I just need to make sure that what I'm doing with my product I'm making a safe product. And, and honestly, most people all want to know that. I mean, they're very anxious to know that because they want to make sure they're making a safe product. And then we also talk about some of the major food safety programs that the FDA and the USDA has that food companies will have to follow. Regulatory. Um, we talk about this both from, your, from the state health department, what your state facility will do, and that would be true in any state, not just Nebraska, but what they regulate and who you have to get a hold of and why you need to start working with them. And then we also go over what the federal agencies do, the USDA and the FDA, and what they're responsible for and, and what they're going to regulate. We talk about, I mentioned processing options. So we talk about, you know, you can rent a facility which might be a shared use kitchen or a small manufacturing facility. They can build a facility. They can also think about using a contract manufacturer. So we go through all these, what these are and what the pros and cons are of each. And then labeling, which is a really big deal. So we spend a, a lot of time talking about this is what everyone has to have on their label. You know, these might be some optional things you may want to include and in helping them understand all the things that were required. Um, you know, even into their type size requirements by the FDA, there are placement requirements where it has to go on the label, etc. And then we talk about um, package design. So in addition to all the required elements, we also talk about things they may want to consider that aren't legally required. But we talk about logos and recipe ideas. And some of this stuff may go on their website. It may not all go on the package. Um, UPC codes, QR codes. So we just talk about all those other elements they need to carefully consider to put on their package. Business development. Now, Obviously, I'm not a lawyer and nobody in our facility is, but what we do is we go through all of these areas and we talk about what's going to be important in these areas. And this is just to give them an understanding before they seek out and talk to professional lawyers, accountants, insurance providers, those kinds of things. We talk about product pricing how they're going to determine what the costs are for their product, and then how they figure out what their costs are, and then also how to figure out, like if you're gonna sell it to stores, you know, how are the stores gonna mark it up? What kind of pricing program do they use? So we go through all that so that they understand that that's gonna be a piece of it. Go ahead. Um, promotion and sales how they're going to promote their product, how they're going to sell it. And this is, this is very um, practical, like how they're going to, if they want to sell it to stores, grocery stores, restaurants, shops, whatever. You know, what kinds of information those buyers are going to need from them, what kinds of materials they need to produce before they go, how to make presentations, you know, how to talk to people. Go ahead. We also spend a few minutes talking about sales reps and brokers. And usually most of the companies at this level aren't using sales reps and brokers. But what we find is a lot of people want to know about that. What if it does grow to where I need help? So we go through and give them an understanding of what a sales rep is, what a broker is, what they will do, what they won't do, um, how product is distributed once you get to that level and how, how that whole system works. Um, and again, that's just because we usually get people that want to know, what if I grow to this big, then what am I going to do? So, And our hope is we help them avoid <laughs> producing a product like this. And that's our hope. Okay. But it's all natural. There you go. There you go. It's fine. Okay, so after we give them that one day seminar, which is kind of like drinking from a fire hose, you know, they're, they're pretty overwhelmed, but they get a lot of good information now that they can digest and think about. 
following the seminar, well, I always have a follow-up call with them because usually they're going to come up with questions they didn't think about or didn't want to ask in a group setting. So then we do all that. Then if they are interested in starting their business and would like to work with the food center and have us help them, they can go into the second phase. Now, not all companies need everything. So we do certainly cherry pick if there's things they've done and they really don't need our help. But we don't find that so much with Nebraska companies because I think most resource providers, as soon as they have somebody that wants to start a food company, they say call the university. But we do get people a lot of times from out of state that have maybe done some of these things and been looking for help and find us. And so maybe they just need to do certain things. But if they needed everything, Basically, what it's going to be is individualized, confidential, step-by-step -step assistance based on their goals, based on their products, etc. Um, we will do a technical evaluation to determine what needs to be done, like do we need product development, do we need any food safety testing, what about shelf life studies, you know, to figure out what are all the things you need to do. Um, we will work with them on identifying where do they want to produce the product at. Um, are they going to do their own facility and we can work with them and talk to them about how to do that. If, do they want a co-packer? We can actually do co-packer searches with them to find a potential co-packer. Um, the business development, you know, that we just talked about, making sure they're doing all the things legally, insurance, accounting they need to do, helping them develop the packaging, figure out what they're going to charge. We can do all that. Um, and I guess those are those next three. And then also what promotional tools are they going to need? And we actually will help them and put those together so that they have those. And then we'll walk through them with, you know, how you need to approach stores. And I even do stuff that if I have companies that are going out and they're like all ready to go and they're like, okay, I'm going to start calling on ABC grocery stores. I will ask them, you know, call me when you're done. Let me know. If, if it turned out great and they're doing great, that's fine. If it didn't turn out great, I want to know what, what happened and see if it's just something maybe they were forgetting or, or what weren't doing quite correctly um, so that we can help them be successful. And, you know, certainly if they're from Nebraska, I try to line them up with, with stores and stuff that I know that are pretty open to local providers and things like that. So if there is an issue, we can help them work through whatever that is. In fact, some of the, some of the stores, um, especially the Hy-Vee stores, say we can always tell when Jill wrote the sales letters for them because these are her letters. <laughs> so, but but they're, they're good for small companies. Okay. Okay. So just a few things about the only thing they attend in person is a one day seminar. However, we were, are working on an on-demand version so that people can do it that way too. And then for the second phase, everything, as I said, is customized to what they need, provided confidentially and long distance. So we get companies from all over the country. They're not gonna keep coming into Nebraska and even people out in Scotts Bluff aren't gonna keep coming into Lincoln. So we do everything by phone, by Zoom calls, by email, um, we've been doing it for 25 years that way. So we've got that part of it pretty well licked. Okay. Um, it takes most companies about a year to complete the second phase. But what I always say is most of our entrepreneurs are working other jobs, so this is part time. Sometimes we get somebody that they want to work on it full time and it can go a lot quicker. Um, costs are going to vary. It depends. Are we going to be doing product development? Is there a lot of testing we need to do for this product? Uh, we do keep track of how many companies stay in business and it usually falls somewhere between 60 to 65 percent of the companies that have gone through the program and that stay in business. Okay. And that's it. <laughs> so I will open it up if there's questions, anything I can answer. Most of the companies actually that we work with are just doing a single product. single product. And what I always tell people is that's somewhat of a financial decision. I mean, if somebody comes in and they're like, I'm doing a, a mild medium and a hot salsa and I want to do them all together, 
that's fine and that that makes sense but we just talk about well your costs are going to go up because you're going to have three different labels and things like that now if somebody comes in and says i want to do cookies and i want to do beef jerky and i want to do barbecue sauce then i'm going to say yeah those are going to be very different you're going to have a lot of different development with them um, but it is a financial decision so we talk about that and if they financially feel like that's what they want to do that's fine or sometimes I'll get people that maybe say, well, I'm gonna do a salsa and I'm gonna sell it to grocery stores and I wanna sell it to food service, which are two very different markets. You're gonna do very different packaging. A lot of things are gonna be very different. So we kind of talk about that and sometimes that will focus them down then, yeah. But I would say most are individual products, yeah. So yeah. It, it varies, yeah. The, the one-day seminar is $250 for one person. If they're bringing anybody with them, it's $125 for each additional person. And then for the second phase, it really does depend. I mean, if we're doing a lot of product and process development and they're doing all the steps that we outlined, most will spend about five to $8,000 with the food processing center. And the biggest chunk of that is going to be the technic work, product development, testing, things like that. So if that's already been done, or if they have a very simple product, like say a dry spice mix, from a technical standpoint, that's a very simple product. So then your cost may not be near as much. Yeah. Yeah. Do you work with the local hy or do you work with like any Well, I wouldn't say that we work with any of them. I mean, I certainly tell people that the hy vs are very open to local products. So we certainly, you know, if they got hy vs in their area and if grocery is where they want to go, I certainly steer them that to start doing that we don't intervene though and make connections or anything no they we don't recommend the headquarters because how high v and many many food grocery stores operate is they do corporate buying but they also let the individual stores place orders so in other words if you go to the corporate level that's to get into all their 280 300 stores so that's that's the products that all the stores carry most small companies can't get in at that level right away. They need to start, say, going to all the Hy-Vee stores individually. And so the Hy-Vee stores say, yeah, this is gonna work in our store and we'll do that. Once you get, maybe you're in 100 of the Hy-Vee stores and once they get some history, then they can go, and this is true for any chain, then they can go to the corporate level and say, I'm in 100 of your stores, this is how much product I sell, how many cases I sell per month. And then if the corporate sees that as, yeah, this might be something we want in all our stores, then you move into the corporate level. Yeah. And then there are some, not many, there are some chains that strictly do corporate buying, which means Trader Joe's is a good example. You're not gonna walk into a Trader Joe's and sell anything because their corporation makes all the decisions, all the stores have those products. Yeah, but most are a combination. Yeah. So I had a client contact me the other day and asked about cosmetics. They were having issues with one ingredient in their cosmetic that they uh -huh. used and where they could go for help in stabilizing that. Cosmetics are right, food. right, right. Yeah. And I didn't quite, I did give them your name to say maybe you might know of someone. Yeah. I, I, I don't know where to send them. Yeah, and I'm not sure I do either. I'd probably have to do a little hunting. I mean, there are certain laboratories. I mean, there are food labs that do a lot of what we do. Um, so I'm sure there's got to be cosmetic labs. The first one that comes to mind for me is called Covance, and they're a huge national laboratory. They have labs all over the country. My guess would be that they would do cosmetics, or if they don't, they would, they would know who does. Yeah, that's a tough one for me anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, just to the front end, you help them also develop the full business plan no, good question. We do not do business plans, and about uh, 
So, but we do talk about Dismas plants in the seminar, why they need one, how they're put together, what kinds of information. And then I talk to them and I send them to their MBDC if they're here in Nebraska, SBDC if they were in other states, but I talk to SCORE and that's, I do. I send them there and yep, all those things. So, you know, there's certainly plenty of resources out of there, out that are there, which is one of the reasons we don't do them because there's plenty, plenty of good help for them. So we do get them lined up. And a lot of times that will come even when I do the follow-up call after the seminar, you know, if they start talking about, yeah, I wanna go forward and do this. Um, but what we usually tell them is, you need to do the feasibility part first. And then once it's feasible, then you write your business plan. Because I get people that are trying to write their business plans and then coming and saying things to me like, well, how much is a co-packer going to charge me? I don't know. We don't have a formula yet. We, don't, we can't figure that out. So absolutely, though, we highly, highly encourage them to do it. Because when you're talking about pricing, price points, you have to have a plan in place in order to determine where you're going and what kind of margins you're going to set. Right. 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 And, and we'll help them somewhat with the pricing as far as, you know, we can, we can help them, you know, figuring out based on like they're doing a salad dressing. So based on their competition, we can look at what the stores are selling it for and we can work it backwards and we can figure out for them. Okay, so here's where you're going to have to land with a co-packer. So as you're doing all this, when you get to the co-packer and they now can look at your formula and give you a price, you know that it's got to land between $189 and, and $2. And if it doesn't, it's not feasible. So you, you either change, you either change the formula, you know, figure out what you can do to bring the cost down, or maybe you decide it's not feasible to do this product. Yeah. Um, we, we want them to do that with their market research. I mean, we'll certainly talk with them. I want to always be a little bit careful um, that I'm not interjecting too much of what, what I know or what I think. You know, I will certainly help them gather information. I will help them look at information. Um, that's not to say if I had somebody that had an idea and I just really knew that this was not going to work. You know, I'm not going to tell them that, but I'm going to talk about, it. I want you to do these, I want you to do this research. I had a company many, many years ago that was doing a product, and I just, I just knew this product wasn't going to work. And she was dead set that it was. And so what I did was actually worked out some market research questions for her to go out so she could interview some store managers. And so then I let them do it. So, but then she got it from somebody and not just one person because I don't want to say this product's going to make it or this one isn't. But if somebody's doing something and I know that, that the trend they're going after is kind of dying, I will make sure to get information to them. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And then let, let them figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a lot of people from Lincoln come and try to do it? I know I keep hearing when I talk to people there's a sad lack of commercial kitchens. Right. Yeah. It's true. Lincoln doesn't have as many. Omaha has a lot more, and even some of the states, you know, as you go west, or state cities as you go west, have them. Lincoln, Lincoln doesn't have doesn't have a lot of them. Um, you know, so if somebody's needing something like that, I talk to them about what's considered an inspected facility and where are all the places that they can, they can check and try to do. Um, for a lot of companies, though, depending on the product, a co-packer really does make more sense. Because let's say you're doing a salsa. Well, a, a co-packer can make probably 100 cases for you in an hour because they've got automated equipment. They can do it very quickly. They're probably going to get better pricing on ingredients because, you know, maybe they're using canned tomatoes. Well, they may be ordering those in by the truckload because they're making salsa for a lot of people. And so 
for a lot of people, it really does make more sense to, to use a co-packer. It just depends what the product is, yeah. And that's something too, the, we, are, we have just started in the last year, we are doing some co-packing in the food center because we're inspected facilities. We do it kind of case by case, figuring out you know, what the product is and if it's something that we can do, we certainly put that out there for people too, yeah. Any other? How many times a year do you do that one day? Time? Oh, the seminar, we do that five times a year. We're done for this year, so we'll start again in January. We do it about every two months. Yeah. Is that on your website? It is. And, yeah. uh, you know, I do, you know, we always do news releases through the university. I send it out to a lot of different listservs and let them know. And any of you, um, I brought my cards. If anybody wants to be on our, our listserv, we send information out. Yeah, I'm certainly willing to do that. If you need more information or want me to send you like a complete packet of information, I'm happy to do that if you don't want another folder to hang on to. Our website has everything that's in the folder plus a whole lot more if you just go to the Food Processing Center website. Yeah. Yeah. For your taste, your... Um, Sensory. Yeah, that you come in and taste the product or whatever. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, okay, for the, for the panelists. That's all, that's all, we do not pay, that's all free. And it kind of depends on what the company is because a lot of the companies we do that for are smaller to mid-sized companies that want that. And so, you know, we're pretty easy at the university. Free donuts if you come do this, you know. If, and, 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 you know, so we get people from all over the campus that, that come in and do that. Sometimes if we get a company that really needs a lot of panelists or something, we'll write that into the project that we think you need to pay them $10 or whatever it might be. So we can certainly do that, but the vast majority do it for a brownie or a piece of pie or whatever. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And if anybody does want to be a panelist, send me your information and I'll get it to our sensory director and then she'll put you on her email list that she sends out. And then if it's ever something you want to do and you're in the neighborhood, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> well, you only get a little sample to taste. Yeah, no, don't <laughs> go back to <laughs> okay, yeah. One other thing, I was working with a, a company and they mentioned that a distributor would waive a shelf space fee. Mm -hmm. Slotting. A minority owned business. Okay. Well, I didn't know about waiving for minority owned. I certainly know a lot of, uh, somewhat about slotting fees. So when you have a space in the grocery store, I mean, all that real estate is expensive. And so the big companies like the Crafts and the General Mills, they pay a slotting fee. You know, it can be $10,000 or more per store to have shelf space. However, small companies, so are often that's waived and they don't do that. And I think this is a really good time actually in history right now for small companies because consumers are wanting locally made products. So the grocery stores know that these local companies are not going to, cannot afford to pay these slotting fees. And so they're going to give them space in the stores. So at the, if you're talking about at the distribution level, I'm a little surprised if you're talking about in the warehouse that they're saying that they will give them free space. Yeah, I'm not 100%. Okay. Sure. Yeah, but I do think that's true for the stores. The stores are pretty flexible that they want these local products in there. Yeah, so they this weigh that. To me looking for, okay, how do I get certified as a woman-owned small business so that I can get that slotting fee waived? Right. And like, right. What do they yeah. accept as certification? Yeah, and typically, typically the typically the slotting fee is at the store level. Yeah. yeah, and you know, I mean, I'm not saying that's not a good thing to promote, but I think if you're a small business of any size and you're local and you're doing a product that they think would go, most of them are going to weigh that. They're not going to charge that for you. Yeah, to these little companies. Yeah. 
Doesn't they do a great job of that for a long time? They, they do. And, and, and North Korea super savers right. because of a diverse clientele that mm -hmm. they have been and Hispanic and, and different products, especially right. the foods in their, in their store. Right. That's the one I saw for statistics. Yeah, and, and B&R, um, you know, all of their stores and everything, they operate in the sense the same way that Hy-Vee. Like, they have corporate decisions, but then they let local stores have products. Yes, yes, yeah. And most grocery chains do run that way. Most do a combination. I mean, all around the country. There are a few that don't, but most do. Yeah. Anything else? Any more questions for Jill? Well, thank you. Okay. So well, thank you. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And hopefully, we'll see you back um, like the second week of January. 2022, 2022. 2022. And we have a full open, a year's worth of open slots of speaking um, opportunities. So if you or somebody you know would like to be a spotlight speaker, please send them my way and I'd love to chat with them. So stick around, network, have more coffee, have another donut. There you go. And have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.